that does it is about, you know, the anonymity is actually what we're creating. I mean, I should have done that earlier, but I forgot. It feels good to be out taking pictures again. Oh my gosh. It just feels good to be out. Well, I'm glad to drag you out. Drag me. Well, he's been to a couple. I think he's got somebody's name that we've gone to a few. So that will be fun. I don't, you know what I dislike? Is water bottles in front of pe can it, people when you try to take the picture and you get a picture of the water bottle. Yeah. Yeah, see, he's got his move to the side. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Move your water bottle, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants a picture of your water bottle. They just said, oh, it's almost ready to start. I guess we should be quiet and sitting down and still be some American. <laughs>
there's a woman here who's got a splice water. And she, as I said, if anybody gets rowdy, she's pulling out her splice water. I said, I'm going to get a video of that. So I hope somebody's a troublemaker. Gotta love people. I hope it's got transferred over okay. I think he said he talked to Jeff. Because Jeff was going to go to my Facebook page and move it to the range. It's not fair if it's just online. Right. Who am I? I'm going to move. Can't vote in the district. You know, you're just barely outside the district. It's it's really South close. Um, Where's the line? It is. Um, so there's actually a big chunk of like West Salinas and so, like the district takes it. It's the weirdest looking district when you look at it on the map. So like Veranda and all that. That's all in the district. Huh. Maybe we'll get resized or whatever it's called, redistrict. Oh, there's a bunch of people watching. Ladies and gentlemen, I am the moderator here at Mitchell. I'm standing with Commander Green. This M does not stand for Mitchell. It stands for Master. And the Master in Green, our president, is Barbara Geiger in the back. She's the reason why you're sitting here. She's organized this, and it's a high priority on our part. So, uh, Yay! So, uh, welcome to the green. Uh, thank you for being our guest. Uh, many of you uh, got the handout, which is our process. I'm just going to summarize it very quickly. My job, our job, is to try and help you compare and contrast these candidates. So one of the things we're doing is taking the questions, searching through them, and we'll be asking questions that they all must answer. So as you can see, strengths, weaknesses, whatever. Um, we've also randomly selected where they would sit. We've randomly selected who will be the first on the uh, opening comments where they'll have three minutes to sell themselves to you. And then when we start the questioning, they'll have two minutes, and again, we randomly select who will start. So, uh, one thing we're not doing is taking questions from people jumping up and waving their hands and stuff like that. And I, I thought Margie was doing that a moment ago. <laughs> so, we're gonna get started. Uh, the luck of the draw for the opening statement goes to candidate Leonard. You will start, and then we will walk through the other candidates, and I'll tell them when it's their turn. Uh, it is now time for you to start. Okay, thank you, everybody. My name is Brent Leonard, and I'm so happy to be here tonight. So happy to see such a great turnout. So thank you for coming here. Um, I'll start off, uh, well, I'll cover three things. A little bit about my background, what I want to work on, and you know, why uh, I think this is so important. So my background, I moved to Fruitdale in 2004, and I uh, grew up here, learning how to drive on 101 before the Fruitdale Improvement Project was done, and so I, I survived Blood Alley. And then uh, my first internship was at the Transportation Agency from Monterey County, working on the Ferndale Improvement Project. And I stayed with that agency for six years and got to work on the San Juan Road Interchange Project. And my last project with the agency was the Pajaro and Ferndale Corridor Study. So it was really a wonderful opportunity to give back to my hometown. And uh, from there, I went on to the city of Monterey and I shifted gears. And I've been working as their affordable housing analyst since 2019, trying to address the housing crisis we have here in Monterey County. In my free time, I serve on a number of committees, the North County Recreation Park District, the Salinas Valley um, Solid Waste Authority Citizen Oversight Committee, looking at recycling and trash collection, the Salinas Valley Basin and Groundwater Sustainability Agency, trying to get our groundwater to be cleaned up and sustainable, and the Castleville Cemetery District, North County Chamber of Commerce. So really, I'm just Mr. Community, trying to give back to 
my hometown. And the reason I'm doing that is a lot for my family. Uh, we, my wife and I are blessed to have two wonderful children. Gracie, who's six and a half, and probably watching on Facebook Live right now. And Galen, who's two and a half and taking a nap. Well deserved, he's had a busy day. <laughs> and so for me, this campaign is about the future. It's about making sure we have a great place to live, a place where the kids can get a good job, buy a house, not have to worry about driving down the road and breaking a tire on a pothole. It's about all day away. And for me, to jump in was an opportunity to take the experience I have over the last decade working in the county and put it to good use, making this be a, a great place to live for, for all of us and, and for our kids. And that's me. That's uh, my background. That's my new Thanks so much. Very good. Uh, we'll move on to Kennedy Melgoza. And your time starts now. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Adriana Melgoza Ramirez. Um, I uh, am a resident of North County. I have lived in different parts of North County for the past 30 years. Uh, and I'm planning to live here for a very long time. This is my community. This is where I grew up. This is where my children have um, grown up. I have three beautiful teens, smart, uh, brilliant, that keep me up uh, long, long days and challenge me to continue to change for them and change for the rest of the teens and the rest of the community uh, in our area. Uh, about myself, I come from uh, like Castroville. I live in Castroville, but I live also in uh, Salinas, in North uh, Salinas, in, um, in that area and then came back because uh, this is a community that I wanted to spend my time in. I work in legal, um, legal aid, and I've done advocacy for resources, for community uh, support and community uh, training. I've done also leaderships to involve community in advocating for the needs, the resources that they desire on a daily basis and that they are desperate needing. Uh, since a very young age, I got involved in community work and I've been advocating since I can remember. Um, I remember at a young age, around 13, uh, 14, I went up to the Board of Supervisors to advocate and to testify on um, we needed a library and we needed um, more spaces for our community to actually engage in positive, um, past positive things. The library was our hangout place, believe it or not, when we were youth, and so we advocated at uh, that level. I also have done community uh, advocacy and at the local and the state level. Right now, I'm a director of a nonprofit and I've worked for nonprofits for the past 15, 16 years. And I've also worked for the school district um, before that. I've invested my time in this community. This is a community that I wanna continue to invest resources and invest time. The reason why I'm running is because I think I, uh, have a duty to make sure that we, our community is taken care of. I'm all tired that nothing has changed since I was a child. And so for me, it's important to push and advocate for changes for generations to come. It's important for our youth, it's important for our families, it's important for our elder, it's important for our children to have communities that are um, successful, communities that have the resources that they need to be able to prosper. And that's the reason why I decided to run. Because I wanted to make sure that those resources come. I don't take no for an answer, and I've been collaborating with different entities and agencies to bring the resources that North County needs and to the resources that all of our community members need. So that's why I'm running. Thank you. We'll move on to candidate church. In a moment, I'll tell you when Sorry, the time starts. <laughs> <laughs> My girlfriend. Your <laughs> time. Hold up. Are you going? Are you, your time starts right now. Good evening. I'm. Uh, my name is Glenn Church, and first, I just want to thank everybody for coming here to this important meeting, and particularly, I want to thank Prudio Grange for hosting this event. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about my background out here in, in North County. I've, uh, you can find that on my website, uh, glenchurchforsupervisor.com. But I've lived out here my entire life. 
I went to school out here, I worked out here, I raised my two sons out here. This has been my home, it'll continue to be my home. I've been involved in local and county issues since the 1970s. But really, this election is not about what I've done or any of us have done. It's about what we're going to do. I've known every supervisor out here since the 1960s, and I've seen county government work, and I've seen it not work. And unfortunately now, there's more of it not working, and that needs to change. And all we have to do is look around at the traffic problems that just came up recently on Sandy Gill Canyon Road the last few years, and Hall Road, and see how bad that's become. You can, uh, you can walk down a sidewalk in a residential area in Casterville. And you can go 50 feet on a sidewalk and you get 50 feet of dirt. And you get 50 feet of sidewalk. And that's just not right. We have roads out here that I know haven't been paved since the 1960s. The number of deputy sheriffs on patrol have been cut by half in the last couple decades. We don't even have an animal control officer on weekends. There is only two litter patrols for the entire county picking up trash. I can remember when they used to come out here, you'd see them regularly. Now you see them rarely. We have over half of the rural unincorporated population of Monterey County living north of Slates. You can count all the people living outside the cities in South County, Crowley, Tierra, Carmel Valley, Pebble Beach, Carmel Highlands, Bryson, Lockwood, uh, Lockwood down there, Big Sur, and that doesn't equal a population out here. We're not getting our fair share of resources. And as a supervisor, I promise I'm going to fight for that. 15 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on to candidate. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right. Time starts now. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Regina Gage, and I've lived in Poondale with my wonderful husband, Stu, for over 20 years. Uh, though I'm originally not from this area, I was born and raised in the Midwest. Uh, I've called California home for many years. I ran in 2018 against the current supervisor because I felt then, as I felt now, that we're like the redheaded stepchild. Nothing personal against redheads. My mom was a redhead. But it seems as though we're not getting our fair share. We don't want more than the other districts. Can we just get what the other districts receive? So I ran in 2018, and while it wasn't uh, an easy decision to run against the incumbent, um, I did. It was an amazing experience. Learned a lot about this community. and. Uh, Though he prevailed, I was then asked to run for the Salinas Valley Memorial Health Care District, and that I did. It's essentially the same district as this area. So I currently serve as the Vice President of Salinas Valley Memorial, which is basically a $700 million organization that, in my opinion, has risen to the challenge during these dark, dark days of the pandemic in the past couple of years. In my spare time, I'm the executive director for Meals on Meals of the Salinas Valley. And I share that with you because I have a breadth of leadership experience. Uh, I've been with the agency for seven years, and during this time, with the help of a wonderful team, we have transformed Meals on Wheels of the Salinas Valley into a dynamic essential service. Last year, I was given the Unsung Hero Award by a local um, agency because of my innovative work during COVID. And again, I'd love to sit here and take all the credit, but it's really the wonderful team that I have. Uh, recently, we were honored by the Salinas Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I, I credit this because of the ability that we have and me as their leader to reach out to different organizations to collaborate. Besides being the executive director for Meals on Wheels of the Salinas Valley, I was the executive director of the Monterey County Bar Association. I reported to a 17-member board of attorneys until they drove me crazy and then I had to leave. But um, seriously, um, I've also been a business development manager, I've been a personnel manager, I've worked for entrepreneurial uh, businesses, um, I also was a legal advocate for domestic violence victims. So I've basically been involved in advocacy for those people who are unrepresented and underserved for decades. 
So I believe that this leadership will serve me well um, in my role as your next supervisor. I'm not afraid to speak out. I'm not afraid to challenge the status quo, obviously, when you go against the big money and big power in this county. There's a lot that we can do, but I think if we're all willing to work together, we can address some of these issues. There are myriad of serious problems, not only in District 2, but in this county. I wish I had handy dandy political sound bites to tell you how we're gonna solve all these issues, but I don't. Seconds. The reality is we're gonna have to come together and have some difficult, serious conversations and make some decisions, but we'll make progress. So thank you. We'll move on to candidate Snodgrass. And when you're ready, your time starts now. Good evening. I'm very impressed with all of you that are here tonight. Spend your Friday night getting to know us better. A little bit about us. Uh, my wife Gail and I have lived in North County for over 26 years. We raised our two sons here. And we're strongly committed to this community. But why run? Our county is forecasting budget deficits in the next three fiscal years of 18.2, 21.3 and 26.4 million dollars. Yet the tax dollars that they're collecting are at all time high. These deficits are not sustainable. Deficits of this magnitude should not come as a surprise, however. The deficits reflect the consequences of the decisions made by our leaders. To give you an example, one county department recently granted its staff 12% salary increases. Now, if that number doesn't surprise you, I went to uh, Transparent California and looked up what those people made, and it's over $20,000 a year salary increase every year. And that's not the, not the whole story. That ratchets through the pension system as well. So I have extension, extensive business experience. I began my career as a CPA, working for one of the world's largest accounting firms. I owned a small business, and for the last 17 years, I've worked as the CFO of Granite Rock Company. I understand complex budgets. I very much understand the importance of ensuring our hard-earned tax dollars are spent effectively and responsibly. But my experience is not limited to, to just business. Over my life, I've served on various nonprofits, ranging from community activism, healthcare, education, in 2020, I was recognized by KSBW-TV as a Jefferson Award finalist, and I was also recognized by the United Way as a United Way Volunteer of the Year. Over the past 12 years, I've served on various county boards and commissions, the Water District, Pajaro Sunny Mesa, LAFCO, the Central Coast Community Energy Advisory Committee, and that's just to name a few. And as a result of this, I have a good working knowledge of water issues, health care, and education. I've gained a good, a good knowledge of how our county actually works. In each one of these areas and roles, I have a strong track record of making effective, meaningful change. So to sum up, I believe I have the financial acumen, the knowledge of our community, and public service experience that will enable me to be an effective Eight representative seconds. for you in North County. So much. Hi everyone. Uh, Kimberly Craig. I grew up on the Monterey Peninsula. Um, moved to Salinas in 2006 and bought my first home, my starter home, which I'm in 15 years later still. Uh, in District 2, I'm in uh, the very northern tip of, uh, of North Salinas. Um, just a little bit of background of, on me. Um, very involved in the community. Uh, I was a president of the Salinas JCs. I was, well, I still am with the Rodeo Concessions Committee, the Air Show, um, and my level of community involvement really sort of spurred around the dinner table with a bunch of friends in 2010 when my car had been stolen out of my carport. And I sort of got mad at that and decided that I was going to uh, start going to city council meetings to talk about the crime in the city of Salinas. Um, so I decided to run against the incumbent in 2010 and won, and then I ran again in 2014 and served my full term till 2018. Uh, in 2020, 
Um, as you know, uh, our mayor unexpectedly passed away, and it wasn't really my plan to run for mayor. Um, but I recognized that the city was in trouble. We had no mayor. We had a city manager who had retired, three new council members coming in, a $14 million deficit, and a pandemic with no vaccines. And so I opted to run for mayor, ran against four gentlemen and won, and I will serve my full term through uh, the end of this year. Um, one of the things I've really discovered this past year in being the mayor, and certainly being the mayor through crisis, um, is that my passion really is in public service. And I would note that the last 10 years I've been in local government, I've done it very part-time. We make $800 a month as the mayor of Salinas. It's a part-time job. I still am the president and CEO of the Monterey County Business Council, but through this past year, I've really realized that this is my passion. And that's why I'm running for supervisor, because it is a full-time job and it allows me, it allows me to serve the public full-time as my passion and a new career for me. Um, just on a last note, um, I certainly am honored to be here today and really excited to share some of the things that I can talk about about North County. So thank you. Uh, we'll move into the uh, question section. Um, candidates, it's two minutes on each of these. Um, the first question, we'll, we'll start with candidate Melgoza. And it is, here's the question, where do you live in the district? Specifically, where do you live? And how long have you lived in the district? I live in Castroville, and I've lived there for- Excuse me, excuse me for a moment. I couldn't hear you again. Fine. My fault. Right here. Reset that time. Just a second. Where do you live in the district specifically? And how long have you lived in the district? Thank you. I've lived in Castroville. Um, I lived there for 28 years and I currently live there. I also live in uh, North Salinas, uh, where near um, Rocky Lane, over by. Uh, Moronga, that area, San, uh, San Juan Great. Um, and then I lived for a very small time in uh, Marina because I was going to college. Uh, so I lived on campus for my last, my senior year since it was easier for me, me to um, finish my college year there. Um, but I currently live in Castroville and I lived there for 28 years and I'm still there. And I plan to continue to be in this area this is my district, this is where I was raised, this is where my children were raised, and this is where I will continue to spend my time, my dedication, and my commitment to, to this community. Candidate Church, your time, if she lives at all, your time starts now. I live uh, about three miles from here on Hidden Valley Road, which is off of Strawberry between Elkhorn and and uh, San Miguel. i uh, lived here since, uh, well, I was born in 1959 in Salinas. Uh, I did live for a short period on Langley Canyon in my 20s, but I lived on Hidden Valley Road pretty much all my life. And, uh, sorry, was there another part of that question? Was it uh, just the living here? Um, where do you live and how long? Okay, well, I guess I pretty much covered it. How much more to say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. As I said, I grew up in Illinois. Uh, my husband Sue and I moved to Poondale uh, over 20 years ago. We were living on a sailboat in Redwood City, and I had master plans of uh, quitting my job and continuing my education. I took the early uh, um, uh, education route, meaning I dropped out of high school. Um, I went back to San Jose State, I worked full time. Uh, we were evicted from uh, where we lived on a sailboat. I worked in Marin County at the time, Stuart worked in San Jose, so he had family in this area. So we moved to beautiful Prunedale. I live on Tustin Road. Um, I had never heard of Prunedale, and really for the first 10 years I was busy working full time, going to school, I finished up at San Jose State, and then I had the brilliant idea that I would apply to law school, and I was accepted into law school. But that's where I live, on Tustin Road in Poodle for over 20 years, so thank you. We'll go to candidate Snodgrass, and your time starts now. 
Well, I, we live at the top of Lewis Road. We have a beautiful view of the old Lewis Road landfill. We've lived there for 26 years. And so, if you want, want to know about garbage, I can talk about it all day long. And, uh, I want to make sure that uh, Regina knows that I grew up in Illinois as well. Uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Illinois. And uh, I'm a so long-suffering Cubs and Bears fan. <laughs> And moving on to the next candidate, just hold on for a second. And time starts now. Yeah, so I live at North Main and Russell Road, the Village North Lagoon condos. I bought my condo there in 2006. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I've been there 16 years. And in the interest of full disclosure, since we're disclosing everything, I did shock up with a boyfriend for a year in South <laughs> <laughs> Have, that's the independent woman in me still has my condo, right? So, uh, so that's where we've been since 2006. Well, I've never shacked up with a boyfriend. <laughs> You're missing out. <laughs> My kids are watching, so we'll keep this G-rated. <laughs> As I said in my intro, we moved to Langley Canyon in 2004. As a, I was a teenager, and we were evacuees from the Bay Area because this was the only place where you could affordably buy land and still have a be close to culture and all the resources we have here. And we moved to Castroville in 2013 as renters, and then we were able to buy our home also in Castroville. Uh, beautiful 1978 home, all original carpets, windows, and paint. Because <laughs> uh, it was still a form place to buy, and we've been there ever since. So, Ferdinand and Castro, for me. We'll move on to Candidate Church. Uh, the, the question is, please tell us what percentage of dollars raised in your campaign are from outside District 2. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how much either because sometimes it's difficult in places like Salinas to know, you know, North Salinas is part of this district, so exactly where is the line out of that. I do know that I have more, you know, of all the small donors I have of $25, $50, $100 donors which are overwhelmingly from inside this district. But I would roughly say it's probably running half and half, something along that line. I, um, you know, have, I just haven't done an analysis on it to really give you a, a full view, but I think that is probably pretty close. Thank you, and uh, we'll move on to candidate Gage, and your time starts now. All right, thank you. I, I quite frankly don't have the exact percentage, but I do know that when I ran in 2018, I had a fair amount of support from the peninsula. Um, I think they liked what they saw, and they liked what they saw on paper, and then because I'm an independent person, I don't think they were so thrilled that I really wasn't carrying their talking points. Also, there's been campaign finance reform for those of you who are thinking about running for office. Um, at that time, it was unlimited, so individuals or PACs could give you huge amounts of money. Now the maximum is $4,900, which in my opinion is still a very large campaign donation. I've had incredible support from um, the trades, from a California Nurses Association, NUHW, SEIU, a lot of other donors within the area, um, not so much from the peninsula this time, but I don't have a specific percentage of it. If you're really that interested, you could look at the 460s report if you want to fall asleep at like 3 o'clock on a Friday night, um, and you can see all the donations. But I've had incredible support from the people who actually do the work in this community. My candidate, um, Snodgrass. Your time starts now. Well, I would say my, uh, my funding is about 50-50. 50% in the district, 50% out. I will tell you that I have funding from my prior employer in all, in all uh, Canada. Uh, they build roads, and I have uh, significant funding from two other construction companies that build roads, and I actually view that funding as being uh, kind of a badge of honor when your competitors are willing to give you money that says, that I think it's a respect thing. But I would say it's about 50-50. If you take those three companies out, it probably runs about 60-40. 60% in the district, 40% outside. 
We're going to be candidate Craig, and your time starts now. Thank you. So I don't have an exact percentage either. Um, I will acknowledge that I have widespread support. Um, I have donors from South County. I have donors, a lot of donors from Salinas, um, just because I've got 10 years under my belt and on, in elected office and with the community. Um, out of Salinas. I have support in Monterey, um, and I also have support here in North County. So one of the things I'd really like to just acknowledge here is that this is a countywide position. Obviously, we are the advocates. Whoever wins this seat will be the advocates for North County and the entire district, too. But it's also about collaboration and making sure that you can get things done. So I'm really proud of the fact that I have that widespread support. I do have quite a few donors, though, here in District 2. Thanks. And moving on to candidate Leonard, your time starts now. Thank you. Well, I like this question because it's always good to understand where the money's coming from. And you know, you can adjust it if there's any inputs attached to that. So I appreciate it. Uh, like Steve, I'd say my percentage ratio is probably 60% in the district and 40% out. I do work at the city of Monterey and I work for a transportation agency for Monterey County. So I've, I've known people throughout the county through those. Uh, two positions. Uh, but my largest donation is $500, so I'm not the big money candidate here. Uh, so I'm more than happy to talk about any of my donations if anybody wants to discuss those. And the next candidate, your time starts now. Love this question. Uh, I have about $150 from outside of North County. The reason why I really know this answer is because those $150 come from three of my interns, because I'm a faculty at CSUMB, three of my interns who have um, seen my work, uh, seen how I uplift the community, and they decided to support, I think, 50 each. Uh, they're still <laughs> students, some of them, so they said, let me support you and give you $50, and I think that that's the reason why I really know the number. The rest of the funding, uh, if, there's, if I could say funding, uh, is from straight from community from North County. Not from outside of North County, it's from North County. And it's funding that is coming from community members who are donating $5, $25, $50. My biggest contribution was $400 from a community member who has done a lot of leadership uh, work with myself and who has participated in a lot of the workshops that I do for community to understand government, to understand entities, to understand agencies. And, and that community member was really grateful because now that community member is able to participate uh, in those different uh, organizations, government, and entities. We'll move on to the next question and the first candidate will be Gage and I'll read this loudly. Tamsi plans a multi-million dollar project for the G12. Will the roundabouts solve the problem of congestion and noise on San Miguel Canyon Road? And what three things can be done immediately to ease danger, noise, and congestion? Roundabouts. When I first encountered a roundabout, my husband and I were actually um, out of the country and it was new and foreign, uh, no pun intended, and I thought, are we gonna spend our time in this roundabout? Because it was just so different, we went around a couple of times, but once we got the hang of it, it seemed to make sense. Um, I know there's a lot of um, pushback, and I think partly it's because they're, they're just not common here. Uh, we met someone recently canvassing, and he called them rotaries, I think they're called rotaries on the East Coast, uh, which was kind of curious. I thought rotaries were building the roundabouts. I, who knew the Rotary Clubs had so much money? Anyway, I think that will solve some of it, but that's gonna take a while. I think in the meantime, you know, it is like a, a, a highway on San Miguel County Road, and oftentimes, like on 156, when there's a collision, it is a serious, if not fatal, collision. I often think that people pay attention when their pocketbooks are hit, so maybe we need to start citing people, giving tickets out more to ease the speed at which people travel um, and reduce some of the traffic. It's not gonna happen overnight, these roundabouts, but we need to start um, taking some mitigating action to ease the burden on San Miguel. The other thing is, we're not gonna wall off North County. North County is a beautiful, 
call it a rural place, but we're not gonna stop people from living here. We're not gonna kick people out. So we have gotta figure out ways to support the businesses and the population <coughs> that live in North County. And candidate Sagres, roundabouts, your time starts now. Well, I attended a G12 corridor study, I believe in this very hall, and I remember one of the uh, one of the people here saying, roundabouts, are they a communist plot? <laughs> and I thought, well, it could be. But I, I will admit that roundabouts confuse me. I would like to see that if Tamsi actually goes forward with this project, let's put only one roundabout in first, and let's see how it goes. Let's do it on a trial basis, because I think I would suspect that most of us are confused by those uh, TMZ has decided that roundabouts are the great solution. I believe they're proposing eight roundabouts on 68 between 1 and 101. So they're the great solution in taking out all the stoplights. I'm not necessarily convinced that that's, that's a good solution. As to what can be done about San Miguel Canyon right now, I think one of the things is we do need enforcement. It, it, that statement is absolutely correct. On, uh, Yesterday I saw two accidents on San Miguel. Uh, both of them had, one of them had the uh, right lane shut down from Paradise all the way to Castro Boulevard. And so having some enforcement, we need some CHP presence. And it ought to be like that little town in the south where the sheriff uh, gives you a ticket. We're going 20 miles an hour to 25 mile an hour zone. And uh, the other thing is I take the trucks off of San Miguel Canyon. There is no reason why we need to have these large semis on San Miguel Canyon. And they can run around, they can stay on San Juan Road and go and go across that way. The only trucks that should be allowed on San Juan Road are for the people that actually have commercial enterprises on San Juan. Thank you. And we'll move on to Kennedy. Craig, when your time starts now. Yeah, the G12 corridor study. So I'm on TMZ. Uh, I currently sit on it. I'm a past chairperson and when Grant was there, so we've definitely worked on a couple of projects together. Um, San Miguel Canyon, you know, I think the candidates up here really have it right in the sense that um, some level of traffic calming measures need to occur. Um, I do think that there are certain things like if, if the sheriff's office is not allowing us to have more deputies out here. There are JAG grants, there are federal JAG grants that pay for those multi-agency collaborations. So when you see DUI checkpoints with different agencies, they also have those for traffic, where all the motorcycle cops from Marina and MCSO and Salinas PD get together and do a month's worth of traffic calming and tickets that get, you know, that get distributed. So, I think there are some opportunities there where it doesn't necessarily cost the county out of pocket, but that we might be able to actually reduce, you know, some of that congestion. I will say uh, I'm a fan of roundabouts. I was initially super skeptical. It was a big giant shim sham to me on paper, but after watching the roundabout go in off of Highway 68 at the Pacific Road Pebble Beach exit and seeing how fluidly um, that particular well-designed roundabout works, for, you know, it, especially during tourism traffic and everything else. Um, I think that they are a good, good way to alleviate traffic. I will say there are not so great roundabouts if you've been down on Riker in Salinas. Uh, you know, they're basically used as launching pads for trucks. So. If it's well designed, I think it's, there's an opportunity there to really um, utilize them in, on San Miguel. Thanks. And candidate Leonard, your time starts now. Thank you. Uh, well, for full disclosure, I was the transportation planner who was managing the G12 study that recommended those roundabouts. And I first met Steve in the Surrey Hall at that workshop that uh, I organized and hosted for that. I think roundabouts are an excellent way to address the issues of uh, danger and noise and congestion. And the reason is um, we have congestion um, and it backs up and that all usually stems from lights, right? And so if you can remove traffic signals 
and allows traffic to flow more smoothly. That's the ground route does. In terms of safety, the roundabout takes away uh, <coughs> so nobody's getting t boned It also takes away red lights, so nobody's getting rear ended. So that's where the safety part comes in. And also for noise, you don't have the braking that you have for a red light. So it helps out all of that. Now, nothing's going to help a high performance exhaust vehicle speeding down San Miguel Canyon and echoing off the canyon walls. So we can't do anything about that. The other issue with congestion is Highway 1. Uh, people are diverting on to San Miguel Canyon to avoid the congestion on Highway 1. So if we can widen Highway 1 and prove that, that'll take traffic off of San Miguel Canyon. Uh, alternatively, people could go back to working at home, and you don't have the commute traffic then that we had during the uh, first year of COVID. So there are all alternatives out there, uh, but round cuts are a good way to address safety, um, noise, and congestion. Kimberly's absolutely right, they do need to be well designed. And in terms of construction phasing to Steve's point, uh, we're not gonna build all of them seconds. all at once. They're gonna come in one at a time so everyone will be able to get used to it. Thank you. And candidate Melgoza, your time starts now. So uh, I think we answer uh, this question on Facebook because we also ask, get to ask uh, and answer questions on Facebook. And the first time that I encountered a roundabout was outside of the United States in another country. And my sister and I joke now about it because the GPS would always say roundabout in the roundabout and we would be panicky because we were like, what are we gonna do with this roundabout? Because if you go to other countries, those are real roundabouts. Yes. Um, the roundabouts here are, some of them are smaller, which uh, for me, it's about safety. It's about safety issues. In roundabouts, you are at a lower speed when you enter them, and so if there's a collusion, the safe, uh, it's, it's less impact into a person. Yes, we need to learn how to use them if they're gonna come, and it takes a lot of training. I think what we can do is start to actually train our young drivers and train our drivers to use uh, all different type of roads because um, they might also move to other areas where these type of uh, roads exist. Um, I think for reducing right now, I agree that there has to be some sort of restricting which vehicles can go in which uh, roads. Um, I had to drive one uh, for my work for 12 years and I saw so many car accidents because of the two lane. Um, I also have family who has been in really bad car accidents in the two, in the two lane, um, who fortunately survived the really bad car accidents. I think that we also need to teach our young drivers, because those are the ones that sometimes I see speedy, to actually understand the impact and understand the, the problem when they're speeding, when they're uh, using the road in appropriate ways. But I think if we truly study roundabouts could be a solution to help with traffic and help with other things. Kennedy Church, uh, your time starts now. Roundabouts. Well, I've seen good roundabouts, and I've seen bad roundabouts. And that's what kind of worries me about this, is I hope that they are taking into consideration on the engineering of this particular problems that exist out here with roundabouts. Because we need to have roundabouts that are going to allow people who have large trucks or trailers to be able to use them adequately and safely, that live in our neighborhoods who will use San Miguel. But I have a particular concern about one roundabout that I'm hope that the engineers are looking at closely, and that would be over at Castro Road uh, Boulevard in San Miguel. We have had problems over the years of trucks coming down that hill, losing the brakes, and ending up in a field. You put a roundabout there, that could be potentially a death trap for a car in there. It's not gonna be able to get out of the way as easily as it can now. So I'm concerned that something like that is going to be addressed. In terms of the three issues to touch upon, I agree, enforcement would be really good. Having some enforcement out there, catching these people, particularly over here at the corner by Mora Road, which you know, all of us, you pull down there, you gotta be looking on your right because somebody's gonna zip in there and cut you off, and it's just, it's, it's, it's like playing uh, lumber cars there almost, and you're, when you're trying to miss the car. 
But there, I think we can also make a, um, a major change that would help a lot of people out, particularly on Echo Valley, if we actually had a real turn lane there so people can get out there on that road. I'm glad I don't live on Echo Valley. Whenever I go by there, I see four people trying to get out, and that is really a mess. But I also think we really need to have some traffic calming uh, report down here on the side roads because that is a spillover from what is happening on San Miguel. People are going too, too fast. Well, there is a problem in North County. Many of us get uh, bombasted with amplified mm -hmm. music every weekend. In fact, some of our neighbors rent out their properties for profit to party goers, and then they turn our neighborhood into the equivalent of an entertainment district. That is the problem. What will you do, if elected, to rectify this situation to help our lives go back to peace and quiet? And we will start with candidate Snodgrass. And your time starts now. Well, amplified music. It, you know, that's something that's germane to all of us in North County. Uh, we hear it on the weekends. You can see you see the tents going up on a Saturday afternoon. You know what you're in for on Saturday night. And it's, the thing that I've learned is that the decibel level doesn't care what kind of music you, you're listening to. And this is a public nuisance. And one of the big issues, and we've heard this, you'll hear this theme with me at least all the time, is we have a noise ordinance today. It's not enforced. It needs to be enforced. It may, be, it may need to be more restrictive. The fines may, may need to be increased. That certainly is part of the public process. And then the one thing that should happen is that the landowner should get the ticket, not the, not the person putting on the party. Because once the landowners get enough of these tickets, they'll stop letting their properties be used. And uh, we need to get this addressed because it is a public nuisance. And it doesn't matter whether it's mariachis, Beethoven, Jimi Hendrix, the noise keeps all of us awake. And so it really doesn't ma matter what it is. We need enforcement and we need to enjoy, as Regina said, the bucolic nature of our community. And I don't think amplified music is conducive to that. Candidate Gray, your time starts now. Thank you. So I actually um, have tried to address this as the mayor. Um, one of the things that I proposed is putting together a memorandum of understanding with the sheriff's office. Um, there are drone operators at the sheriff's department. There are drone operators who are sworn police officers at Salinas Police Department and Marina. And similar to what we did a few years ago with the gang task force, where we had 10 or 12 officers roaming the entire county handling gang issues, I suggested that we put together a drone strike team. Part of this is so that when there's a party in North County and there are 200 people in the backyard, you're not, you're not sacrificing officer safety by sending one or two cops into a big giant backyard and a raging party. You send a drone in, the officer has the video on the drone, and then they bring it back and you issue an administrative citation to the property owner. And you make it a giant fine, $2,500. This way, like in the city of Salinas, when it's Beirut on the 4th of July with all the illegal fireworks, you have a drone team that goes out and can issue administrative citations. Over in Marina, when there's a big event, you can have drones out there. And in North County, throughout the year, you can actually have drones issuing those administrative citations through county council. Um, it's something that we've done uh, in other scenarios with the county, and I think it would totally work here, and it's minimal out-of-pocket cost. The respective departments, like the Monterey County Sheriff's, would be paying for one or two officers from their drone team to be part of this, to be able to roam around and effectively handle the scenario of all the seconds. noise that you guys have here. So, thanks. And candidate Leonard, time starts now. Thank you. Uh, I'm just a little shaken. Drone strike hits party in North County. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, 
in this is obviously a serious issue. It's also an issue that shouldn't exist. It should have been resolved a long time ago. So many cities and so many counties have functioning noise ordinances and proper enforcement. Uh, so I fully support what the county's doing now in revising their ordinance to make it more functional and useful and also increasing the fines. One innovative idea I think could be useful, and it's, it's in this revision, is to have code enforcement issues and fines instead of the sheriff's department. Because the sheriff, as we know, is understaffed, and this will always be a low priority compared to a car accident or a violent incident. Uh, so the city of Monterey does something similar with uh, short-term rentals, the vacation rentals. We have an on-call uh, code enforcement agency that works nights and weekends just to target that particular nuisance for that community. And I can see a similar model for North Monterey County where we have an on-call code enforcement officer working nights and weekends and really able to come out and be responsive and to enforce a good ordinance and then issue those fines. And I think uh, that would be a good direction for us to go on this issue. And then they'll go So like copy and paste, but not, not the drums, I'm sorry, but not the drums. Um, I would say that for, for me it's about enforcement as well, but also about uh, understanding that there is an ordinance. Believe it or not, there is a lot of community members that still don't understand that there is an ordinance. And this is because I've been talking to people about it and they say, what ordinance? <laughs> and so if they don't understand that there is an ordinance, then how do we enforce it? Or how do we make sure that it's, it's um, something that they are doing? And again, this comes not just with the noise ordinance, but with a lot of policies that exist. Some people don't understand that they exist, and we need to be able to tell them this exists and enforce it in a way that it makes sense, right? In a way that we are enforcing uh, throughout North County, enforcing throughout every party that is existing and making sure that we're doing it in a way that people are seeing it as a safety matter and also as something that is, is not just because uh, we want to enforce about noise, but it's actually what also other issues are arising out of it. And also, we want to make sure that communities <coughs> continue to understand the consequences of that violations and look at the current ordinance and work with other supervisors because at, at the end of the day, if we wanna update the enforcement or update the code, we wanna make sure that the other supervisors understand why it's an issue for North County. Why we're bringing this up and not see it as something else because we all know that they saw it as a racial thing. And we, if that's not the case, we want, need to make sure that we address it and that we need to make sure that we let them know that this is about other than race that it's about the noise, the safety, and the enforcement that's happening. Can any church uh, noise violations? Well, believe it or not, this is not a new issue. We've had problems like this out here for years. Back in the 60s, one of the first zoning laws prohibited dance halls because there was a lot of country music being played late at night. I remember a problem near where I live in the 70s or the 80s with a rock band that was going up and practicing on top of a hill every Saturday afternoon or every other Saturday afternoon. These things did not last and go on because the county took, them, took care of it and did something. That is the difference that's going on now. The county is not acting. It has the tools to act. It has not acted. But this is a lot more than just an amplification issue as was pointed out in the question and, and, uh, and Grant talked about with code enforcement. That is exactly the first step that should have been done on this long ago on these commercial parties. There are health violations going on there. They're selling food, they're selling alcohol, there's parking violations, they have right sanitation, there's zoning violations going on. You can't put a machine shop right and run a business without a permit, and you sure can't run a commercial park without a permit. So, that this has been going on for this long is really disturbing and just shows you how out of touch and how unconcerned Monterey County is with dealing with the problems out here in North County. This is number one information. Uh, candidate uh, Gage. 
your time. Thank you. Uh, yes, again, we're the uh, red-headed stepchild in North County. This obviously is a serious issue, and it depends on where you live. We live on Tustin Road, so we don't hear a lot of music, but when we first moved in, we had a neighbor who had turned their backyard into literally a motorcycle raceway. And I was going to school full-time at the time, uh, working full-time, and I went over and asked them if they could stop, and they said, well, that's why we moved to the country, so we could do whatever we want. And I understand that on a certain level, but your right to do whatever you want basically stops when that starts impacting my quality of life. So I think I agree with many of what um, the other candidates have said. Is it's one thing to have an ordinance, it needs to be enforced. And I think there's a difference between these commercial ventures where people are making thousands of dollars and maybe the anniversary party or the quinceanera party or graduation party. I also think that maybe if some folks could go to their neighbors, and maybe that's a little naive, but I think sometimes the first step is communication. And again, we don't have the music in our area. I also want to say that when I ran in 2018, one of the most eye-opening things I did <coughs> was I went on a ride along on a Saturday night with a deputy sheriff. And you talk about eye-opening. And they did get a call to one of these parties. And I just ask everybody to think about this. I'm not making excuses, but you've got one sheriff pulling up to a party where there's probably 100, 150 people. People have been drinking all day. People are probably packing. The sheriffs were nervous. Now, fast forward four years later, we obviously have a, a sheriff's race, which I hope all of you are paying attention to. It's very important and it's very serious. Uh, I think the sheriff's department has been um, has not been led in the most confident way. They are understaffed. They are feeling impacted by morale. One of the things I would like to do is actually have a community meeting seconds. with some of the deputy sheriffs to get their perspective. But obviously, um, the enforcement needs to be the, the code needs to be enforced. And I say once again, get people's attention by giving them a stiff fine. They'll probably think twice about the next time they throw that party. This is um, a bit of a long question, but I, I'm going to read it. Uh, today's article in the SACB cites that California's marijuana sales are as low as they were in 2018. They have been dropping. My question is how would you help tackle the many problems that permitted cannabis business owners have, such as price per square foot, and high local sales tax, making the products too high to sell well. And, we're all uh, we'll start with candidate Snodgrass. Actually, do yes. you want me to start? Yes, I okay. do. Thank you. Uh, uh, just because it was an extra long question, if I may make the request that you repeat it, that there's at least three of us up here that are trying to take notes. Right. Um, basically, the question is that the high taxes at state and local levels have slammed into marijuana sales, making it hard for them to make an affordable product and their price per square foot is low. But I will read the exact word. Today's article in the SACB cites that California, California's marijuana sales are as low as 2018 and dropping. My question is how would you help tackle the many problems that permitted cannabis business owners have now, such as price per, per square foot and sales and, and high local sales taxes, making the product prices too high to sell? Got it. And Thank you. Your time starts. So uh, this was actually an issue that came up, uh, came forward to the city of Salinas. The city uh, was one of the first uh, in the county to allow manufacturing to occur. Um, and so we were quick to adopt quite a bit in terms of the ordinance. I will say, and I've given some of the cannabis companies a hard time because they're, they're concerned about the tax levels. Uh, but I've said, you guys were there in 2015 and 2016 asking us to tax you. They asked the county supervisors to tax them because they were motivated to get that cannabis up on the up and up, legally done. Um, what it ended up doing, the unintentional effect of giving 23% in taxes to cannabis is it exacerbated the black market. And so now you have people who are trying to do it the right way, pay their, pay their fees, pay their um, taxes, but ultimately they're competing with people that aren't paying taxes. 
I'll just acknowledge that um, I'm a proponent of um, the free market, but I also believe that um, it's really important to make sure that we are we have a thriving economy. Um, I know that the county receives millions of dollars in cannabis taxes, but if cannabis goes away because of a big giant bubble or it's too costly to do business within the county, and they decide to go to, you know, Hemet instead, then we are left with zero tax dollars. And those tax dollars are what pay for our roads and fix our potholes. So while it is a legalized industry, it's really important to make sure that it's commensurate with other counties and what other counties are charging. And I would note that local cities and the county need to be lowering both their per square foot costs and their uh, sales tax, added tax. Thanks. Good timing. Have a great letter. Have a Absolutely. Well, uh, it's always tough to start the legal industry. It's even tougher when the illegal competition has no um, incentive to stop, right? There's no penalty to be an illegal farmer now unless you get caught. Um, and there's not enough enforcement on that. And so the black market has burgeoned, and the uh, legal market has collapsed. There's been a stunning rise and fall of cannabis in California, uh, but we're working through it, as Colorado has done, as Washington State has done. We're all learning and adapting. Uh, so this is something the Cannabis Advisory Committee at the county will need to continue to address. We need to keep working with the cannabis industry to lower the taxes, to reduce the regulations on it so it can be a successful industry. And then you need to have funding for the enforcement. So to go out in the Santa Lucia Mountains and tackle the illegal grows that are going out there. And Santa Cruz County to have the illegal grows in Santa Cruz Mountains tackle. And across the state of California, more enforcement on the illegal side. Um, but this is an important industry. You know, the county has funded a lot of projects in the last four years with cannabis money. And when I was chair of the North County Chamber of Commerce, uh, we had our first dispensary open in Castroville, and I took the whole board over there. And uh, you know, it was the first time for these people to see the legal operation. And if you haven't been to a legal dispensary, I recommend you go. You don't need to buy anything, but it really is an interesting experience. It's sort of um, a jewelry store meets liquor store. And uh, <laughs> it's an interesting model, and I'm sure they'll work it out, but we need to be here to support that industry. Thank you. We have um, one of our candidates had to leave because of an emergency. Her daughter was taken by ambulance to the hospital. Oh. Um, the green commonly said, says prayers, and uh, so we'd like to do an emergency prayer for her. If you're comfortable, please stand up. <laughs> Father, we come to you, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. Father God, we lift up Jimena to you, Father God. You know the situation, Father God. Right now, Father God, I ask that you give Adriana strength, Father God, as she gets to her daughter, Father God. Father God, I ask that you prepare the doctors, Father God. You get them ready and the nurse and the staff, Father God, so that they can tend to her, Father God, and give her what she needs, Father God. Father, I also pray for a speedy recovery, Father God, right now. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, touch Jimena from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, Father God, with your healing blood. Father God, we thank you, Father God. You said when there are two or three gathered that you will be in the midst of us. Father God, there is many of us right now agreeing, Father God, for this little girl, Father God, to get better, Father God, and be taken care of. In the name of Jesus, we all say amen. amen. <laughs> So, Candidate Church, the issue is marijuana, local sales, cost. The time starts. Uh, well, I know I, I'm sure the rest of the candidates up here uh, really uh, hope things turn out well here for uh, John. And I'm sorry to get to care of this. So, on the cannabis, the problem we have uh, really going on here is, is taxation. There's several problems, but one of them that sticks right out is taxation. This is about the only business I know of that's not taxed on its revenue, it's taxed on its growing area. I have a Christmas tree farm up in uh, up the Hidden Valley. If I was being taxed for the acreage that I'm growing trees on and not what I sell, 
I would really have some problems. It would be a lot less profitable business than it already is. And you know, that's something that really needs to be changed to make this a lot fairer. Is you've got to tax a business, an industry that is particularly one that's having declining sales on those sales, not on their growing area. That's, there's just something wrong with that. That's just not the way to do it. Second thing is, we are netting about $12 million from the cannabis industry right now in this, um, this budget. But it would be higher, but we're spending $5 million for enforcement. And some of this enforcement practices, this is not hunting down illegal growth. This is a legitimate legal operations going on here in this county. The regulation appears to be overly burdensome because it's actually getting in to some with regulations that should not be affecting business practices of how you're growing. It's getting into too much in that detail. So we need to cut back, ease up on those regulations. You need to go through, redo the tax basis onto this, and those are, I think, are two of the most important things that have to be addressed. Thank you. Um, I agree with much of what has been said. The revenue needs to be taxed. Um, I also think, again, you encounter the, uh, uh, I wouldn't say amazing, but the county bureaucracy. And I know this from looking at Meals on Wheels, uh, as your executive director, just, just to get somebody to return your phone call. So you've got this county bureaucracy. You have a relatively new industry. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but I think maybe they should have looked to some other states first to see how they were doing it, to see some of the problems that they encountered. Um, it's, it's, it's an important industry, obviously. I mean, it's really beneficial for a lot of people. It provides jobs, it provides taxes, which we all need. But obviously, the enforcement needs to be more um, <coughs> substantive in the areas and not from a paperwork, bureaucratic standpoint. So obviously, some things need to be changed in the cannabis industry. But I do think that we need to keep it here. We just need to work out the red tape and make it more efficient. And candidate Snodgrass, your time starts now. I'm going last, I could say ditto to everything you said. <laughs> but one of the things that's happening in the cannabis industry is sheer economics. And any of you that are in agriculture know this, that when you have a bumper crop, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're making a lot of money. And so, uh, you can only make a lot of money if you have the bumper crop and your neighbor doesn't. And I think that the cannabis industry is going through some growing pains. And so one of the things we're looking for is relief from taxes. I'm not a big tax guy, but cannabis is uh, basically, this is what's called a sin tax. You pay a tax on alcohol over and above an excise tax. And this, ta this tax money, one of the things I've advocated for without any success, I'll, I'll be honest with this, is We've got these cannabis dispensaries in our communities. Virtually every significant community in North County has a dispensary. I'd like to see those taxes go to fund Manzanita Park, the Pajaro Park, the Aromas Park. Let's let's put those tax money put that tax money to work. And uh, ditto to everything else that was said. And yes, candidate Leonard, you will be the one to start this out. Regarding wildfire, what can take, what can the county do to assist property owners with wildfire? Right, well this is a very important question up here, particularly in Kerndale area, Royal Oaks. Um, we don't want to be the next paradise or the next Santa Rosa. And for me, the biggest thing was making sure our fire district is well funded. Because the North Monterey County Fire Protection District is the actual first responder agency for North County. So the Pasanti Station, Castro Station, the Las Lomas Station. And they were in a funding crisis. They've lost six firefighters, and they needed a special tax in order just to get back up to staff. And I'm very proud to say that passed last year, and they have new firemen working, so we have a better first line of defense. Something the county also has done is use community development block grants to pay for new fire engines and new equipment for North County Fire. Uh, North County Fire didn't have a new engine until the county provided that funding. Everything was beyond uh, where it should be. It's all old equipment. 
So providing better equipment to the fire district, and then for homeowners, providing assistance to get you to that 100 feet of clearance to remove undergrowth, to remove brush and dry grass. Um, if that's a chipping program, if that is having grants for low-income seniors, for instance, who may own the home and not be able to take care of it, to have gardening services come out and trim the land so it's a protected area around the house, those are all good ideas. And I think there are probably some models from other counties that we can look to and build off of. But that's the victory for me, is funding the fire district and then supporting the homeowners to get their um, defensible space. So I guess that's a big two, actually. So thank you. And candidate church. <clears throat> Wildfire, your time starts now. Well, I think what this county needs is a wildfire management plan. North County is a prime area for a wildfire, and as Grant mentions, we could become another Paradise, California, but there's other places in this county. Carmel Valley, Big Sur, we all, we just saw those fires a couple of years ago. But, you know, I want to give an example of how effective this could be. Back in 2007, Lake Tahoe Basin developed their own plan. It's called the Lake Tahoe Basin Forest Management Plan. They had a fire just prior to that. So they went through, they developed a plan, coordinated emergency services, did prescribed burns, environmentally sensitive clearing, they created access roads behind subdivisions so that equipment could get in, people could get out. And last year, you may recall, there was a caliber fire that burned right through that doorstep and threatened to take it out. It stopped partially because of this. This is what we need in this county. And that we're not doing this is, you know, it's not a matter of if we're gonna have a fire, it's a matter of when. We also need to do some other things. We need to do something about these eucalyptus. These are almost fly on the trees around, and you can imagine that the tree that catches on fire can burn twice as high as that tree. And we get a windy day, this place is gone. So we need to go through and remove as many of these trees as possible, get a hold of some of the federal and state funds that are coming down, and help property owners on that. We should also go through and reform some of our county laws, such as this Ordinance that is right now, if you can't cut up a dead oak tree without getting a permit. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I, I was on the first committee in the 1980s that helped establish the oak tree protection permit. That was not on. Seconds. I don't know when that got on. I don't know how it got on. It's, it's senseless. It doesn't have common sense. And we should also have a shipping program for the county. And candidate Gate Yes. All right, thank you. Obviously, it's a serious problem. You know what's interesting, though, is when you talk to people in other parts of District 2, besides um, Broomdale, the rural areas, it doesn't even seem to enter their lexicon of thinking. But for us, it's a serious issue. I do think we need a county-wide um, plan, and it has to be effective, and it cannot just be meeting after meeting after meeting. There's got to be a plan to take action. I do agree that we need a, a county chipping program. Um, also, these eucalyptus trees. They are a huge fire hazard. And I'm wondering, and, and bear me if I don't know if there's a milling company, I've read that uh, eucalyptus is being used for other purposes. So first of all, it's incredibly expensive to have the eucalyptus tree removed, thousands of dollars. The average property owner doesn't have that. So the county's gonna have to do something. The county's not gonna do it alone. There's gonna have to be grants that are available, and maybe that wood can be used for other purposes. I mean, I'm not saying you're building homes, but they're building furniture out of it, they're using it for trim. So, um, you know, instead of getting rid of that wood completely, maybe repurpose it. Um, as far as the oak trees, again, that's insane that you have to, you can't even figure out what the process is. Have you, have you, have you visited the county website lately to try to figure out how to do it? It's enough to make you run screaming in the opposite direction. So again, serious issue. Um, I think the county has to have some priorities, and this is one of those priorities. And James Snodgrass <coughs> and wildfires. Thanks, well, the first thing I think we need to do about wildfires is we actually need to assess neighborhoods to make sure they have a, they have a good wildfire evacuation plan. One area that I visited is Ponderosa. There's one way in and one way out of that subdivision. And if you look at the, at the trees that are in there, they're old growth pines. And pines are equivalent to eucalyptus when it comes to uh, burning torches. So I would uh, recommend the first thing we do is we assess, the, uh, assess our, our North County area and then we actually have evacuation plans so that at least we can address the immediate danger of fire. The 
The other thing is there is a countywide study that was done on fire safety. And that was done by Monterey County LAFCO about two, three years ago. And the Board of Supervisors formed an ad hoc committee consisting of Judge Phillips and Mary Adams. And I've not heard what the results of that are. But we have an unequal funding uh, mechanism there where, for example, I believe Pebble Beach Fire gets 22 cents of every property tax dollar for fire protection. We get 11 cents for North County Fire. So we have a big funding disparity between the two. The other thing we need to do is we need to make sure our insurance companies can't cancel us. Yeah. Many of us have had our fire insurance canceled, and we were, I, I personally, my wife Gail and I personally, we were in AAA for 30 years. For 30 years they took our money, and then they canceled us just like that. We need to, they may not want to write new policies, and that's fine, but they need to honor existing policies, and seconds. we need to work with uh, our state representatives, such as John Lear, to make sure that doesn't happen. Try to get, uh, great wild bar. Thank you. Yeah, so there are um, both state and private grants available, particularly to homeowners associations. So I know some of the areas uh, here in North County do have HOAs, um, and you can apply for those grants to help pay for the cost to clear that 100 foot area around your house. Um, I think certainly having organized efforts as a county supervisor to be able to walk people through the process, like if you're gonna apply for a grant with your HOA, you should probably get some instruction on how to do that. Um, but I also think too, a community forum where you have insurance agents that can insure your property. There, I'm working with um, a group of people out in Carmel, it's not even in Salinas, out in Carmel who had their insurance canceled after the Sobranes fire. And there are a couple of insurance agents here in Monterey County that are independent insurance agents that can actually go to a myriad of different companies to try to get insurance for those that are at risk of wildfire. Um, I am really proud and I just want to acknowledge uh, that the North County firefighters have endorsed me as well as the Monterey Regional Firefighters and Salinas Fire. Um, fire has obviously been a big topic in the city of Salinas this past week for those of you that watched the news and saw the Taylor Building go up in flames. Um, I have certainly recognized uh, the need for mutual aid and the problem that occurs with understaffing of your firefighters. So I do think uh, making sure that we have good and well-funded fire departments is one of those critical elements to successfully fighting a fire, and it's especially a wildfire, and having the appropriate equipment, it's not a fire engine or a fire truck. It's, it's a whole different set of equipment to go after wildfire. So just on my end, um, I would say that there's absolutely an interest on my end to further explore it, but it's absolutely an issue that I'm willing to address and can successfully. Thank you. So we're gonna start uh, with Candidate Church. Um, the current Board of Supervisors is running a deficit budget. What cuts would you make to avoid the state of non-sufficient funds in the county. And your time starts now. I think it really depends on maybe properly allocating funds too, and looking at some problems that we have. One problem we have is this county is paying an exorbitant amount of money on lawsuits, settlements, and judgments. We're paying almost 2% of our budget is going for that. I want to well, is that high? Is that low? I looked at Los Angeles County, 20 times our size of population and budget. All these cities, all these overlapping jurisdictions, it's gotta be a mess to operate. We're paying almost 2% of our budget going for these legal claims. They're paying four tenths of 1%. We're paying almost five times that rate. There's something wrong there. There's an administration problem there. If we could get that down, that will free up right there tens of millions of dollars. Then there's also just how are we going to allocate money. But coming before the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday is a $10 million plan to resurface Laguna Seca. We have an $18 million deficit coming up. How are they paying for that? They're using almost half of it, $4.4 from the cannabis tax fund to pay for it. 
it's not going for roads out here, it's not going to protect county services. These, this is, there was a discussion back in 2018, different forums around the county on how this money should be spent. Wanted people to go through and give input on, on how people said libraries, roads, a homeless issue, on um, a preschool. Now it's going to go to pay for a racetrack. 15 seconds. I think we, it's a question, not of just cutting, but of reallocating, and it's a question of finding out why we have so many lawsuits in this county we're paying so much. The candidate Gage, which I'm sorry, Mr. Thank you. I remember a couple of years ago, I believe it was in 2018, there was an overture of, uh, I think, $20 million on a system that the county bought, and somehow nobody was really paying attention. They don't know how the money was allocated. So again, you have to have someone paying attention. I have been the chief financial officer of a nonprofit taking care of troubled children. I've managed complex budgets. While at Meals on Wheels, I have not only doubled the budget, expanded the services, um, but also doubled um, the revenue coming in. Coming in, so it would be great if we could increase the revenue in this county. You know that's a challenge, but I think you have to look at uh, possibly cutting certain areas. And I do not think those areas should be public safety, whether that's fire, uh, sheriffs, police. Um, I sometimes think that you need to look at the top, and I believe that the folks who gave themselves a raise were the present board of supervisors who gave themselves a raise um, in the past uh, year or so. And, which is outrageous to me. Again, nobody wants to have anybody lose jobs, but you have to look at what you're paying people and where the services are needed. As far as uh, what, what uh, Glenn mentioned, I think it's outrageous. Laguna Seca, really? And we can go back a couple of years to see how that whole deal was uh, figured out behind closed doors, how somehow one of the supervisor's close friends and big donors got that contract. So again, it's this county, it is you know, the, 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 the backroom deals being made, and we out in District 2 are not getting, not more than Carmel Valley, not more than Monterey, or we don't see like, can we just get our fair share? So obviously the budget is gonna be huge, uh, but we're gonna have to look at it, and I firmly believe that we are not going to cut uh, public safety and services. Thank you. And moving to candidate Scott Grass. Uh, cuts in the budget. Well, the first thing is there is a roadmap in regard to how to spend, how to spend our county money uh, more effectively. I'd encourage you folks to go look at the grand jury website. There was a purchasing study done by the grand jury. So, for example, if Kimberly is running one department and I'm running another, and we both buy our pencils from different suppliers, we don't get a discount because we don't buy enough pencils. But if we work together, we'll get a discount. So that purchasing policy, that's a painless way of cutting some of the uh, waste in government. But I will tell you my favorite story uh, is in regard to a computer system upgrade that our county embarked upon, and they budgeted $4 million for this computer system upgrade. By the time they were done, they spent $40 million. Oh. So you want to talk deficit? Now here's the other piece to that. The County Board of Supervisors, a little, a little bit over three months ago, approved a $700,000 expenditure to write a request for proposal to replace that system. It will cost millions. So just think, just think about that, and I believe in the budget deficit numbers I quoted at the start of this presentation do not include the replacement of that system. So my, my point is, hang on. And the other thing I tell you is, I don't want to cut public safety services. But we have a sheriff's department that had, based on Transparent California, in 2019, so we don't know what it is today, there were over 80 sheriff personnel making over $200,000 a year in total compensation. Wow. Now that also ratchets through, if you know the budget, the uh, pension funding formula, that they basically get a percentage of their la average last three years of compensation. And so if you increase that compensation, you actually increase the pensions as well. And candidate Craig, your time starts now. Yeah, thank you. So we've, uh, I definitely have experienced a myriad of uh, budget deficits over the last 10 to 12 years that I've been in office. 
Um, there are some really creative ways that you can actually lower your, your budget without actually having layoffs. Uh, one of the things that I would look at is certainly the workers' comp. I mean, obviously, we have quite <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of county employees, and certainly workers' comp, I know, in the city of Salinas was a huge issue. Um, people that were out for years on end, and what we can do is create and offer up frontline settlements to be able to lower that long-term debt for the county. Um, I would also note, and uh, Mr. Snodgrass uh, alluded to it, CalPERS, the, the pension debt that is associated with, frankly, any county, any city in California, is remarkably challenging. Um, there are ways that you can lower your uh, overall debt by paying up front. It's a huge <coughs> chunk of money. It's kind of like paying down you know, some of the interest on a home loan. Um, but making sure that you have um, the availability to be able to make some of those difficult decisions. I also would just say that I somewhat um, doubt uh, how the budgets are presented. I, and I know all of us have been watching. But it's interesting to see certain dollar figures get uh, approved by the Board of Supervisors and then they come in and money moves around all the time. What gets presented and approved may not necessarily be what's executed. So I think there's really an opportunity there to audit some of that and make sure that we are, um, as supervisors, we would be approving a, an amount for a particular project and that that amount gets spent for that, not moved around behind the scenes. Thanks. Candidate Leonard, your time starts now. <coughs> well, as shocking as my high school math teacher, or as shocked as my high school math teacher would be to hear me say this, I've turned into somewhat of a numbers guy. Um, I'm an analyst at work. I run my housing office budget. And then uh, serving on the board for the recreation district, the central trade district, and other districts, we do the board budgets every year. Uh, the Board of Supervisors has had a structural deficit for years. And they have been able to taper that over with revenue from the cannabis fund as well as revenue from the federal government through the aid program through COVID. And both of those are drying up. So now we have an $18 million deficit this year, facing $36 million in the next couple of years, compared to a general fund of over $800 million. So that's about a 2% budget deficit. So what you're looking at is targeting that 2% cut the different 26 departments and see where you can reduce that. Alternatively, I'd like to see more revenue growth, more economic development, more events at Laguna Seca, more events at Pebble Beach, where the county collects tax revenue at the lakes in South County. If we can grow our industry, then we grow our tax base. So that's an alternative. But I think we need to look at the clear picture here, that percentage-wise, it's actually a small amount of budget we're talking about being in deficit. And Kimberly's correct, the county does budget adjustments regularly, and there are special requests that come up, and then there's a mid-year budget adjustment. So uh, you're all constantly looking at these numbers. Uh, and a lot of what's presented now in February through June to get approval are unfunded positions. The Sheriff's Department, for instance, is asking for a budget that includes 27 unfunded, unfilled positions. So that money's not spent if somebody isn't hired. So it's kind of a fake number you're looking at. So you really need to dive into the numbers, but for me it's about generating new revenue and then uh, making targeted cuts if you need to. Uh, the next question, if uh, candidate Church will be taking it. I think I did the first one. Uh, Gate, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, candidate Gate. Uh, the Board of Supervisors controls the Sheriff's budget. If you were elected, would you be for or against defunding the sheriffs for defunding the sheriffs? Yes, sir. And explain the reason. Would I be for defunding the sheriff? For or against? I am against defunding the sheriff. Um, I do think that it's really good news for this county that the current sheriff is uh, not seeking re-election. Um, I think the sheriff's department is a very important, essential um, service. I'm not sure if we need to give money to buy the newest, um, latest, militaristic style equipment, but I do think that we need enough people 
for enforcement. We need enough sheriffs to be able to come out in North County and deal with these quality of life issues. So I am not for defunding the sheriff. And I'll just say that um, I recently was endorsed by the Deputy Sheriff's Association, and that's not why I'm saying uh, not to defund them, but obviously it's public safety, and I think that's very important. So um, I do hope, again, as I said, that folks are paying attention to the four candidates who are running who are running for sheriff, an essential, essential department. So, no, Ed, I'm not for defunding the sheriff. Okay. Well, I wasn't clear enough. <laughs> and candidates not dressed. Your time starts now. Well, I too am not for def defunding the sheriff, but I do believe we have a management issue in the sheriff's department. And again, I, I harken you back to the amount of overtime that the sheriff's deputies are paying, being paid. What we need to do is we need to figure out how to get more deputies, more boots on the ground, and see the sheriff's department more often, and get those people out there on the streets. And uh, there's a management issue where that overtime needs to come down, and that overtime can create more boots on the ground. So I would not support defunding the sheriff. Kennedy Craig. Yeah, so this question's been asked in a bunch of different ways. Um, like, would you be supportive of an oversight committee? Um, how do you feel about the current sheriff? I know uh, the question of, you know, what, how you feel or if, if you as a supervisor would censure a sheriff or what do you do in that capacity? And I, I, I've heard candidates answer that, well, you're in charge of their budget. And that's essentially defunding the sheriff's department because you don't like the sheriff. That's certainly not... Um, helpful to the entire county and the residents of the county when you reduce the budget of the sheriff's office. Uh, I have 10 years of a pro-police background. I went through a police academy in 1995-96, graduated. My bachelor's degree is in criminology. My master's degree is in Homeland Security Studies from the Naval Postgraduate School. I am very, very pro-law enforcement. I think that particularly in a city like Salinas or even in North County, quality of life also includes feeling safe. Um, that is a huge, huge element of mine and certainly would not be in favor of defunding the sheriff's office. Thank you. Candidate Leonard, go ahead. Yeah, so the simple answer here is no, I'm not in favor of defunding the police or the sheriff's office. Uh, the Sheriff's Office currently has a $130 million budget, give or take. And like I said, many of those positions are uh, placeholders. They're unfunded. They're funded, but they're unoccupied positions. And that's why we have an issue with not having enough patrol deputies. So we can hire more deputies just with the budget we have. Uh, so that's good news. We just need to get people recruited. In terms of overtime, you know, my brother is a police officer in San Jose, and he has earned a lot of overtime because he works 80 or 90 hour weeks because they don't have enough police officers. And so he's there responding to the public service call, as our deputies are here in Monterey County. So the budget for the sheriff's office, if you have funded positions, but they aren't hired, your budget's doing fine. Uh, you just need to get more people there to improve the services to the community. And that's something that I've heard loud and clear in Castroville, and Ferndale, and Pajaro, that we need better response times. And so until we get up to that good level of staffing, and we're really getting a good quality service from the Sheriff's Office, uh, we don't need to be talking about uh, cutting funding. Candidate Church? No, I'm not in favor of defunding the police or the Sheriff's Department. As I mentioned earlier in my, in my opening statement, the number, number of deputies over the last couple decades has been cut in half, and this is a real problem. As Steve made a comment about overtime on there, the Sheriff's Department right now is using up the bulk of the county's overtime. It's about eight and a half million dollars being spent on overtime. Much of this is mandatory forced overtime. This is a real problem. We need more deputies because you don't want to make a deputy miss his or hers daughter's birthday or some other family gathering or just needing some time off and go out into the public and and deal with the public is you're going to have a problem just with the deputy who's being stressed 
perhaps with the public who is, you know, is, is, is stressed also on the, in a particular situation. We have to have better working conditions. So we need more deputies. There has to be less of that mandatory overtime. Uh, but there is also a problem with the people, as Steve has pointed out, that some of these deputies are taking a huge amount of money, far exceeding their salary, because they're willingly taking this overtime. And then it's creating a problem, as Steve explained onto there. So there are management problems that need some reform, but we need an effective and happy sheriff's department, frankly. Mm -hmm. And you just can't stress them out. I'm, I'm traveling down here a little bit. Uh, so this should be uh, candidate Snodgrass. Monterey County is becoming more, and North County, is becoming more Latino each year. As supervisor, what have you done to prove your commitment to earn the Latino votes so far, and what will you do in the future? I'll read that again. Okay. Monterey County is becoming more Latino each year. As supervisor, what have you done to prove your commitment to Latino voters so far, and what will you do in the future? Well, I wasn't aware that I'm a supervisor, so I haven't done anything as a supervisor. But I will tell you that when I was on the Pajaro Sunny Mesa Community Service District Board, we were approached by the County of Monterey uh, to build a park. The county said, if, if we build this park, will you folks operate and maintain it? And for those of you that have not spent any time in Pajaro, there is no open space there was no open space currently of any consequence within the confines of Pajaro. So we decided that we had to build this park. And we built the park, but then we ran into problems where we said, well, how are we going to fund the operations and maintenance of this park? Because Pajaro is Sunny Mesa, their district stretches all the way down to Prunedale, and you can't ask people in Prunedale to pay for a park in Pajaro. So we organized a bunch of businesses, community leaders, religious leaders, and government leaders, and we raised money for a five-year fund to maintain and operate that park. But then the next question that we had out there was, there's a fair amount of gang activity in the community of Pajaro. So how do we make this a safe place? And so we went to the Central Coast YMCA, and we struck a deal. And the YMCA runs summer camp, they run soccer leagues, they run t-ball, they run Zumba. And we, the, today that park is a vibrant part of the community. So that's, that's one thing that I've been involved in, in with the community. I'm quite, and quite frankly, I'm proud of what we've done in Bob in, in relation to that. Seconds. In relation to what I would do, I would continue to uh, bring people together to serve the communities and to bring, make sure the Latino uh, population is well represented. Candidate Craig. So I represent 165,000 people as the mayor of Salinas, of which approximately 77% are Latino. And uh, recognizing my Scottish heritage, um, I recognized very quickly as the mayor that I needed to be the mayor for all. Um, one of the things that I have done for Latino voters in that role um, has been focusing on the Alisal, the east side of Salinas. Some of you have seen uh, quite a bit of work go in to our downtown area. It was called the Downtown Vibrancy Plan. The focus now for the city has shifted to the Alisal Vibrancy Plan. Part of that is just the underfunding and underrepresentation of the east side for decades. So I'm really proud of being an advocate for, um, for our Latino community. And certainly as a North County supervisor, I think that that equally is just as important. Uh, I'm committed to having bilingual staff. I'm also committed to having community meetings and all of the material in both Spanish and English so that everyone is seen and heard. Thank you. Go ahead. 
Thank you. Yes. Um, no question. This is a majority minority community, and you know, Latinos are the largest growing portion of our population. And you know, what have I done to do that? I've served on the committee serving North Monterey County, North Monterey Recreation Park District, the Cemetery District, the Chamber of Commerce, Partner College Measure T Oversight Committee. Uh, we have a college in Castroville now. We have a recreation center that serves a thousand children a year and provides adult programming and senior programming. We have supported small businesses and uh, Latino businesses through the Chamber of Commerce. Um, this county, or this district of the county, has an overwhelming number of disadvantaged communities, federally disadvantaged, low-income, traditionally uh, service-deprived communities, like Pajaro, and Los Lobos, and Castroville. There's no pharmacy in Castroville. There's no pharmacy in Los Lobos. Hmm. Pajaro has to go to Luxembourg. Uh We need more services. We need to support services that uh, support the Latino community through health, through economic development, through affordable housing, um, all of it. And we need to realize that it's not one Latino community. Are we talking about the first generation, second generation? Are we talking about the kids, the seniors? Are we talking about the Latino community that doesn't speak Spanish, that speaks an indigenous language? Uh, it's not an easily identified category or one size fits all, uh, a bunch of solutions that you can present. You need to understand the community you need to go out and work with them hand in hand. And that's what I've done at the rec center, and the chamber, etc. And that's what I do as supervisor. 15 seconds. Thank you so much. Kennedy Church. Go ahead. The Latino community is very diverse, and it has to take a diverse approach. I have. I made a real centerpiece of my campaign of going out and knocking on doors in North County. And I've been out to communities in Los Lomas, Pajaro, and I don't know if anybody else has been out to some of those. I don't speak Spanish, but I bring my son, who's fluent, and does. And I've had many one-on-one -on -one discussions, listening to people who are not used to a, somebody who's running for office anybody that would be potentially associated with the government coming to see them on any kind of friendly terms. So it has been very enlightening to hear this, to learn this, to experience this. But this is the kind of thing that I or anybody else who's going to be in office needs to do. You need, as a supervisor, to go out, whether it's a Latino community or any community, and make yourself aware and present. We have nine or ten distinctive communities in North County here. Los Lomas, Pajaro, Castroville, three largely Latino communities are three good examples. Part of what I will do if I am elected is I will hold monthly meetings at, each, at a different community each month. But I want them to be small meetings, not like the ones we've seen where there's lots of people there and then questions get passed off to county staff. It wants to be me. Maybe my staff and that and a small group of people and have discussions. And we need to go into these communities and listen to them, listen to their concerns, listen to their problems, and address some of the basic seconds. needs that have to be done. Because you have places that like this that are these unincorporated urban areas like Castroville and Pajaro that are extremely neglected. They don't have good sidewalks, they don't have light. Good. All right, thank you. So um, in our current campaign, I do have bilingual staff and bilingual volunteers. We do have uh, some of our materials in Spanish. Uh, but what I'll do when, hopefully, as elected to you, as your supervisor, I will continue with the same innovative, collaborative approach that I brought to Meals on Wheels. And let me give you an example. Um, we have a program, it's called MASA. Um, it actually stands for something. We started at the beginning of the pandemic because we were overwhelmed with phone calls from everybody who was suddenly homebound because of the governor's um, mandate. So it stands for Meals on Wheels of the Salinas Valley and our Salinas Valley Community Partners in Action, MASA. I know it's a, it's a, it's a, a mouthful. Um, but what we did is, because we didn't have the funding to support everybody, we reached out to local restaurants and specifically locally owned restaurants, many of them were um, Latina, Latino owned, Stevie's, 
in Prunedale, um, uh, uh, Lewes on, on, on Main Street. Um, and we had this agreement. We also worked with MST and IT, and many of those drivers were Latino, to help them stay in business. We helped these restaurants stay in business during the pandemic. So that was one thing. Another thing I've done in my agency, and again, I will bring the same leadership and spirit of collaboration, is we create a program called SOCO's Social. Um, that's a program in South County. The South County is predominantly Lat Latino, and again, it stands for something. South County Senior Social. We go out to King City, Soledad, Gonzalez, and we're launching in Castroville once a month where we provide a lunch from a locally owned, uh, predominantly minority restaurant. We bring information to seniors, we bring uh, 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 fruits and vegetables from the food bank, and we provide a musician. So that's some of the work I've done at Meals on Wheels, and I'll bring that same leadership and collaborative approach. Um, in my role as Vice President of Slings Valley House, Healthcare board, we have started the mobile health clinic, and that's been amazing. Most of the people who use that service are Latino, underserved people of our community. So I will continue doing that in my role as supervisor. The people are amazing. They're hitting things on time. <laughs> um, so, Ken was great. You'll be the uh, big miss. In the last 45 minutes, uh, you've been asked about a range of issues, problems, and concerns dealing with District 2. Based on your background and your work skills, what managerial technique or skill will you apply to advocate for District 2? Can you go? Would you like me to go over it again? No, I no, I think I got it, but okay. I just you okay, I'll just go ahead and start. Right. I thought there was a go. Okay, got it here. Um, so you know, one of the things that I have come to realize in the managerial role I have at the city, and as the CEO of the Monterey County Business Council, collaboration really gets you places. Um, and I, I know that sounds super cheesy, but when I first came on board as the mayor, Wendy Root Eskew, who was the chair of the board at the time, reached out to me and said, hey, the city and the county are working on our permanent homeless shelter, and we're going to sign off on a 50-50 cost share agreement for the service provider who's gonna run the shelter. And we were gonna have two separate meetings. And she called me on Monday night and said, hey, what do you think of this? And I said, I think it's a great idea if we actually have one meeting with all five supervisors and seven council members. Um, that way everybody hears the same information, the same public comment, the same staff reports, and then you can make a good decision based on that. Um, so we brought the city manager and the city, uh, or excuse me, the, the CAO, Charles McKee, together, and they probably thought it was a terrible idea. And, um, you know, we said, okay, let's unpack that. And the reality is, it just had never been done before. Um, you know, what I would share with you as, as, as a supervisor for District 2, I'm really proud of the work that I've done with all five of the current supervisors. I have the endorsement of Supervisor Phillips. I also have the endorsement of Supervisor Alejo and Supervisor Lopez. So while you might have the greatest ideas in the world, if you can't get to three votes, it's not a very good idea. That being said, I'm super motivated and excited to represent District 2 and the entire area, and I'm really motivated to get some stuff done for this area. I am um, I'm thrilled about collaboration, and I think I have a really great relationship going right now to where I can get some stuff done for everyone. Thanks. And Dave Leonard, manager of techniques and skills. Absolutely. Um, you know, if I was a voter, I'd want somebody who has the experience. And uh, that's what I, one of the things I bring. It's 10 years of experience dedicated to Monterey County issues, whether it's transportation agency from Monterey County, working on road studies and the Premier Improvement Project, or affordable housing in Monterey, or groundwater sustainability issues on the Groundwater Sustainability Agency. You know, I've built the resume to try and be ready to hit the ground running. And so I bring that experience. I also have the, um, you know, an analytical mind for this. I'm a policy nerd, and this is a policy nerd profession, or sure, so it should be. You know, you're managing 26 different departments, a 1.7 billion dollar total budget. Um, you have to be able to, to take a look at the issues and understand what you're looking at. 
In terms of managerial skills, um, you know, I manage a staff at the housing office and serving on the boards for North County. I've interacted with the staff at the rec center, the cemetery district, the chamber, etc. And so being able to work with them, with your staff, having an open door policy is key. Also knowing what they're doing. You don't want to be the boss who doesn't understand what the employees are actually doing. So uh, being hands-on, and then being hands-on with the public, public engagement, going out and talking to the community. Um, that's again something that I've done. We mentioned at the beginning of this meeting, we hosted a G12 study in this very room. And uh, you know, I organized that. I reached out to thousands of people in North County to try and get the numbers here, to get the engagement going. And I've done that in every position, and that's what I do with the supervisor, too. Go out, get engaged, be a supervisor of the people, but be a supervisor with experience to get the job done, too. Can I church? Go ahead. I worked for myself since I was 18. You learn skills come up out of there. I feel I have a skill of looking for that common area between people that can disagree. And I think that's really important in a supervisor besides being able to listen. That is really important in this county too. And how what's going to happen with the supervisor that comes on here and how that relates with the rest of the board of supervisors. This county it's been divided since the 19th century, basically, between the Valley and the Peninsula. There's two votes on the Board of Supervisors that represent the Valley's interest in Salinas, and there's two votes that represent the Monterey Peninsula. This is really a swing vote here. And that vote needs to be used to benefit the people in this district so we can finally get our share of what we should be having, but also to try to bring some compromise together throughout this county. We have had issues on water, on housing, on traffic that have been going on for decades. They were first talking about doing something on Highway 156 in the 1960s. <laughs> it's time to do something, but unfortunately, we don't get compromise going on in this county. And we need to have compromise. And that's where I see my position on that board, is I have told people on the peninsula or the valley, don't count on me for your third vote. My first interest is here. My second interest is what's good for this county. We need some solutions. Thank you. So I think one of the best predictors of future success is to look at what you've done in the past. And I have a track record, and that's been running on my track record of dynamic, impactful leadership. Whether it's being at Meals on Wheels, uh, Chief Financial Officer of a nonprofit, Legal Advocate for Domestic Violence Victims. I know how to collaborate with people. I know how to bring diverse groups of people together to make decisions and provide services. So I will, I will bring those skills to the role of uh, Board of Supervisor. Um, I also take a very hands-on approach. I don't expect complete agreement. I think complete agreement is the end of all conversation. We're not always going to agree. I do always agree with your spouse. Of course you don't. Uh, we have to have some honest, difficult decisions, and I'm willing to do that. I've literally engaged with thousands of voters in this district by having uh, meet and greets and coffees and, and putting myself out there in the community. This, of course, is in addition to my, my full-time job as Executive Director for Meals on Wheels of the Salinas Valley. Um, I'm also not afraid to make difficult decisions. I think we have too many um, kicking the can down the road. We have got to start having some serious conversations and making difficult decisions to get things taken care of in this county. So I will bring those same skill, skills to the position of Board of Supervisors. Candidate uh, Snodgrass. Well, I'm a firm believer that you model the behavior that you expect. And one of the things we have to change in, change in government is the go we, need to, we need to go back to where government serves the people, not people serving the government. And so we need a customer service oriented government. And the only way that I can make a difference in that is show from the office that we are customer service oriented. Take the time to work with the people. Collaboration has been discussed in relation to the other supervisors. That's absolutely of paramount importance. But it's also important to collaborate with the staff. And I'm committed to having a staff that's very diverse from what I am because I have my own uh, prejudices, 
uh, my own viewpoints. And I want to hear other viewpoints so that at the end of the day, you have kind of a big ball of clay that you just kind of form and shape in different areas. And you look at different solutions. And there is no one perfect solution to social problems. But you look for, a, you look for the predominantly best social solution. And so what I would advocate is that we have a county government that we work to be fair. You know, if we're late on our property taxes, we get a 10% penalty. But if the county owes us something, they don't get a penalty. <laughs> we need fairness. Uh, and it needs to be re reciprocal between us and the county. And it should be a customer service type of thing. And Glenn mentioned that he would hold uh, community meetings. I'm committed to holding the supervisor's office open until 8 o'clock at night, at least one day, one day a month, so that you can come visit me outside of your working hours and so that I'm accessible to you. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're done with the questions. Uh, we worked very hard to um, get a lot of them. We had to rephrase some of them, but I hope we did that well for you. The candidates have been very good about and flexible trying to give good answers. We're now at the stage where the candidates will give us their last two minute pitch uh, of why uh, they should be your choice. Uh, candidate Leonard will be starting. Very good. Well, again, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and staying at this point until 8.30. Um, that's really incredible. Uh, this is one of the best crowds I've ever seen in a public meeting, and that makes me excited uh, to know that so many people are interested in this election. Uh, this is a change election. Supervisor Phillips is retiring, and it's a chance to really take a new look at things, to reevaluate what we want for North Monterey County. And I mentioned what I want. I want it to be a thriving place. I want it to be a, where you can buy a home, like I did, my wife did. Like where you can get a good job, like we did. Um, where your kids can have a great place to play and feel safe. Where you have quality water that you can drink. Um, all of these very basic quality of life issues that unfortunately are often not attainable right now. Now things have changed just in the decades since I got out of college. And I think we need to get back to where it's more easy to succeed. Um, you know, I'm running, as I mentioned, on my record of service <coughs> and commitment to this community. It really is a passion of mine. It's what I went to school to do. It's in the blood. I mentioned my brother's a police officer. My sister's a teacher. Uh, my mom's a retired teacher. And my dad was a doctor. So we're a service family. And you do this work because you care. Um, you don't do it for a paycheck or anything else. And if you do, you do it for the wrong reason. So for me, it's a passion for this area. And it's a passion for the future. Because I want Gracie and Galen and our new son is going to be born next month, Brady, to have, you know, a great opportunity, a nice place to live. And I think that's what we all want. City Jean seconds. And uh, a thriving area. So please take a look at me, take a look at my pants on the back, have my cell phone on it, always happy to engage with you one-on-one. Thanks so much. Ready? Okay. Uh, Glenn Hayes, Glenn Hayes, Glenn Hayes. Since October, I've gone out just about every afternoon knocked on doors out here in North County. I've been to 4,500 doors. It's a lot of doors, and I don't know if there's gonna be another candidate that's crazy enough to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's been a really interesting, and one, one best, I would say best, probably one of the most wonderful experiences of my life. One of the things that's interesting, you know, I'm 63, I'm a big guy. So I've gone up to people's homes on Elk Corner Road, or Vega Road, People look at me a little cross-eyed. <laughs> but when I tell them that I'm running for supervisor, everything changes. Almost every day I'm told by people that they've lived there for 10 or 20 or 30 years and no candidate has ever come to their door until I have. I tell them that I feel that if you run for office, you should go to the people. And that's what I've done. I've talked and I've listened to people. And I know none of you are asking for anything special from the county. You're just wanting to get some better government. And that's why I'm running for better government. Because we are 
sort of the forgotten red-haired stepchild of this county. But it's time that this county stepped up and started to do its job. I know that we're not going to solve all the problems in the next few years, but I'm hoping we can solve a few of them and maybe get us on the right path for solving more in the future. So thank you. Thank you for coming this evening and listening to us. Thank you. And thank you again for taking time out of your busy day and spending Friday evening with us. Um, as I said, in 2018, I believe I had the courage Did to run. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 I just had the end of the world peace, and now I'm about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was really good. It was okay. To run in 2018 against the money and the power of this county. And rather than running away and hiding after I did not prevail, 5,000 votes to his 7,000 votes, I was asked to run for the hospital board, and that I did. And I did very well. Um, I will bring a proactive, dynamic approach. I know how to get stuff done. I know how to work with a di uh, diverse group of people. I have city council members who have endorsed me from Salinas. I have my entire board of the hospital. And some of these folks are very different ideologically and very different politically because they know that I'm a woman who does what I say I'm gonna do. So again, we have some really complex problems, but if we're gonna solve them, we need to come together and have some conversations and make some changes in this county. And I would be honored to receive your support on uh, June 7th during this primary. So thank you. Can I start this? Again, thank you all for coming tonight. North County is very diverse. You know, we, we have many diverse communities, Prudale, Moss Landing, Pajaro. No one's mentioned the Robes. I mean, I think Robes might be the forgotten community, but then there's Los Lomas, and we need a strong advocate, a strong voice, so we get what we need. And we, we are the redheaded stepchild, I think we probably beat that one to death. I mean, you, you didn't coin that, I'm sure that was coined. When, when was that coined? But the, uh, the point would be is that we need somebody who's going, who understands the diversity of the entire community that's going to fight for what we need in this community. Further, we need somebody with business experience that has actually managed, I've managed 50 people at a time of, of very diverse backgrounds, from IT people, those people are different, let me tell you. I don't understand them, I don't understand IT, but we need people that are accountable to us. I mean, we need to hold our government accountable, and we need a leader who's accessible, and if you want to know who I'm talking to, call me up. I'll tell you uh, what, what I've had on my schedule, so you know if I, if I'm, what I'm talking about. You know what's going on. We need transparency. We also need to be notified as to what's going on in our community. Projects crop up, crop up in North County that we don't know about, and all of a sudden they're, they're there. And we don't have a good process. And we need a good public process and we need a supervisor who engages with the community, communicates with the community, and listens to the community. And so I, I pledge to be that person. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come and speak to everyone today. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I've had 10 years of part-time local governance. And um, it's something that I have come to realize that after 25 years in business, it's where my passion lies. And so turning to my wonderful partner and say, I wanna leave my very successful career and go represent the people is really a big deal to me. I do wanna just address the elephant in the room because I'm here at the Prunedale Grange. Like there's a lot of discussion about North, North Salinas and Salinas and Prunedale and the division there. We are all district two. And what I can share with you is for the last 10 years, I have worked on potholes. I have worked on traffic. I have worked on noise. It's about collaboration and making sure that you can get stuff done for the area that you represent. District two is all encompassing. And what I would just um, like to say is that it's really important to remember that 
you know, despite, and I won't use the R word for redheaded stepchild, but what I will acknowledge is it's a phenomenal area. It's a beautiful area and it deserves representation where you can actually get some streets paved and you can get some potholes fixed. I think I can do that for you. I have the relationships, I know staff. It's one of those opportunities, I think, for both you and for me to actually shift the tide for North County. I'd be honored to have your vote. Thank you. After one comment, the uh, candidates are gonna come down to the floor. This is from the range. One of the reasons that we stepped forward to have this forum was this is the first time in decades that there's been funding constraints on donation to campaigns. That has allowed a smorgasbord of talent to come on this uh, dais, this, this stage, including Mel Bozer. Because people who don't have the big pockets can bring talent to this table. Please give each candidate thoughtful consideration because you have a chance of making a big change in Monterey County. Please come down and meet your <laughs> Yeah.